We'll be starting the session in just a moment. If you have any connection or technical issues, try refreshing your browser first. If this doesn't work, please go to the help desk by clicking breakouts on the left or click the people tab on the right and search help desk to send a private message. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome back, everyone. We hope that you enjoyed the first day of this virtual World of Flavor yesterday. It was so wonderful to see your reactions and interactions in the chat and to see how much you loved being transported to all of the different places where our presenters took us. Keep it up today as you chat with, with each other and ask questions for our presenters. We took a whirlwind journey around the world yesterday, stopping in Canada, Spain, France, Morocco, Mexico, Japan, Turkey, Nigeria, and Ghana. That's a pace we'll continue to follow this week. Some of our destinations will include Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Singapore, and Peru, among others. So keep on logging in every day. We I want to thank our sponsors who make it possible to offer this program tuition free. Please make sure to visit them in a sponsor expo during the break and reception today and chat with them as you would if you were at Copia. And as you know, uh, and we know that nothing replaces tasting products. So here is how you can sign up for virtual tasting sessions. And you, you'll get that information in a second after the sponsor thank you. So I'll just pause for a minute so you can see here is um, the link you can follow for tasting products. And like yesterday, I want to invite you to take screenshots of sessions and share them on Instagram with the hashtag CIAWOF. You can find our presenters' Instagram handles at the end of their hop in bios. So tag them freely and tag us too. We are at CIA Industry Leadership on Instagram. And every day there's also a post there with uh, all of our presenters' handles to make it even easier for you. You can find all of the recipes, PowerPoints, videos from our presenters, and recordings of the sessions on the resources page of our website, worldsofflavor.com. Log in with the password you received earlier this week. We have another poll up for you on the right, which asks what is most important to you when you create a menu. 
And don't forget our scavenger hunt linked in the chat. If you pay close attention to presentations, you'll have no troubles answering, which means that you'll get a chance to win great prizes every day. And here is a preview of the day ahead. We'll start with stories of origin with three presenters who'll share how, where they come from profoundly sh who shapes who they are as cooks and how they work to preserve that when their communities are under threat. We'll have our first set of breakouts today, which includes a live co cooking demonstration of a plan forward meal with Ming Tsai, including a tomato martini, a panel on evolving as chefs and entrepreneurs in time of constant change, moderated by Plates Chandra Ram and featuring Gabrielle Etienne and her tall grass food box CSA, Alice Delcourt of Erba Brusca in Milan, Italy, and Hawa Hassan, founder of Bas Bas Condiments and author of the newly released In Bibi's Kitchen, the recipes and stories of grandmothers from the eight countries that touch the Indian Ocean. And Michael Galata, Brian West, and Michael Ponzio will demo breakfast, barbecue, and snack recipes. Our pop-up session during the first break will demystify the simplicity of Shabu Shabu. And our Meet the Author includes Hawa from the, and for, presenters from our first session, Melissa Martin and her book, Mosquito Supper Club, Cajun Recipes from a Disappearing Bayou, and Sofia Muzoki, author of 16 Ugandan Dishes to Make, and My Vegetarian Kitchen, 34 Delicious and Wholesome Dishes from a Kitchen in Uganda. Without further ado, let's start with our first presentation today. We'll have time with our three presenters at the end, so please put them in the chat throughout the session. What does it mean to dig deep into where we come from to develop menus and businesses? What does it mean to feed our communities food that comes from the same place they do? And what happens when strangers eat it too? This session features presenters who look inward before anywhere else as they develop their food philosophies. They farm, forage, and fish, and work with farmers, foragers, and fishermen. They're absorbed by question of sustainability, the sustainability of their environment, and just as much, the sustainability of their people and their culture. Our first presenter is an artist and cultural preservationist based in Apex, North Carolina. Gabrielle Etienne uses diasporic and local foodways as a vehicle to reimagine wealth, marginalized food systems, and inheritance. Her work uses oral history, film, cooking, and textile to examine and explore the Black experience in relation to land cultivation, sedentary practice, and agronomy, creating contemporary source materials for historic work and knowledge. She's also co-founded the North Carolina-based Black Farmer CSA Tallgrass Food Box, about which she'll talk more about in the panel following the break. There's no better way to introduce Gabrielle than through her filmmaking work. So let's watch her make magnolia leaf wrapped braised rabbit saddle in a smoky pot liquor with collards and butter beans before she joins us on screen after the video. Let's roll it. So this meal was actually inspired by a story that my grandfather tells about bread rabbits. And so I'm doing rabbit saddle that I'm going to tie off with some of my Aunt Isabel's magnolia bay leaves. I'm going to braise it in a broth that I'm going to make from the ribs that I smoked over hickory, some rosemary, and the collard pot liquor. And then I'm going to add some butter beans at the end. You know, let that all cook in the oven as well. We're not actually going to add anything to the water until it's like a certain color. I would say like the color of sand is kind of what they're looking for. And you can really achieve that with food, but we'll see how close you can get to that with rabbit today. These colors are actually from um, one of our farmers that we work with. We have a CSA where we source from black farmers all over North Carolina called Tallgrass Food Box. COVID struck and there was really nowhere for them to put their produce at the time. It feels like a part of our cultural food waste here in North Carolina and in the South to create a market where there is not one and to sell what we have and to bring to see our communities. I had my rabbit, which has been browning overnight. I put some soy in there, some hot dog pepper, 
and I expect not more on a rabbit, the saddle is this part right here, right? This is, these were the legs that have already been removed. And then this part here, where the spine connects to the legs, that's the saddle. I feel like the saddle is uh, less acknowledged um, when you're cooking rabbit, but it has this gorgeous bone when it's throughout it. So it's a great piece of meat to braise, to be seasoned by, by the bone. To me, when I was growing up, rabbit were all, uh, all these things were just kind of like um, things that my great uncle Andrew, my grandfather, said it was pet and salt. And, and talk about and you know as a child I thought it was hilarious and like why would you do that why would you eat that um why would you eat a rabbit I look how cute she is and then I went and got it with and realized why wouldn't you be a rabbit my mom's generation you know they kind of wanted to get away from that and so we didn't eat that. We were eating Italian food a lot of times. He's really kind of the culture teacher, so he was the one that was doing rabbit, rabbit, so hunting for and killers. And so it's really exciting to be able to like find the value and appreciate this thing, even if it's never like that. I play with these a lot. I love these. This season is about anything. It's very rare that I even use sweet bay, like laurel bay anymore, because these are so accessible. So, my grandfather had this story from his childhood, a brother of it, so. I'm not going to play around like I can tell this story like he can, but essentially, bro rabbit and uh, bro turtle and bro lizard, they all, <laughs> they all got a house together. When they were building the house, they neither needed manure for the garden. And so, you know, the turtle doesn't want to go because he's like, I'm too slow, I can't go. That's going to take me too long. Oh. Listen. Well, I'm so small, I can get enough to pay for that. No, you're smart. Well, I'll go. He's been on the town. He just stayed around waiting to get the house built. No, he's going to get all the work done. Some guys, the house is built, they have a butt bed and everything. Come to the front door and he's trying to figure out if he's even at the right place. So he knocks on the door, the butler comes, and he's like, I'm looking for a brother lizard. And the butler's like, oh, you mean a brother lizard? Well, he's out in the yard. So what about uh, brother Turtle? Where's he at? You mean Mr. Turtle? Oh, he's out by the way. And so he's like, okay. So you go and tell Mr. Turtel, who's out by the well, and Mr. Lizard, who's out in the yard, that Mr. Rabbit is here to the shit. I just love watching him tell the story. In this moment of joy from his childhood. And I feel like the, the smokiness and the paprika is going to really pick up that chicken from the rabbit society area. What's beautiful is pot liquor is a pot liquor is a pot liquor, so those collars and their stems are going to make it hot either way. <laughs> Recipes were always, how, how does it feel, how does it taste, how does it smell? I feel like those vibrational 
ways of being, it's almost like an ancestral inheritance to be able to cook that way and feel confident cooking that way. I, I love playing with food and I love like just the experience of cooking it for the first time and letting people taste it and seeing how they react. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, for this real treat of a movie. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, Anne. Hi. Thank you for sharing your family with us. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh <laughs> And so why does it feel important to re record the stories and lore from your grandfather's childhood for you? Mm, uh, I feel like the lore and um, a lot of the stories that they share, just they feel like uh, something for us to decode and use, right? For ourselves and for future generations. There's something in like the self-sufficiency element in a lot of these stories, there's uh, the seed keeping and honestly, a lot of our agricultural traditions are like weaved up into these stories. And so um, being able to like film my grandfather telling this story um, is really beautiful because um, he, you know, a lot of times it takes him back to a place where he's, um, exploring a very specific time. And a lot of times when he shares these stories, it feels like it comes right on time for me. There's always like a word, right, in these stories. Um, and so being able to have direct access to that, it feels important to be able to like film that, share that with other folks, because to me, um, a lot of our identity is woven up into those stories and that history. Um, and a lot of the things that we can keep and use moving forward. And it's the kind of things that I think a lot of us think about doing and never get to until it's too late, right? So this is a beautiful reminder to to not delay those kind of record keep keeping. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I was, you know, I was living in New York at one point and definitely prioritized coming home to um, to spend time with with him and with his brothers and sisters because they have so much wisdom they have so much to share um and i was finding honestly i was finding so much of myself in them um and so it, it i feel honored to have been in a position to make this my work and to you know take the time and spend the time with them that i have and one of those um, sad stories, but something that really motivates your work a lot is that part of your family's uh, land is being taken away by uh, to build a highway, right? Um, so what is your dream for your estate and how has the highway changed that? Yeah, so I feel like uh, there was a point, I think last year when things were happening, my great uncle who I talked about in the video um, was actually moved from his home um, during this project and kind of displaced from this community he's been a part of for so long. Um, and so it's really been important for me to make sure that not only I preserve like the visuals of what it looked like before, right? Like him in his yard, yard making wine, what his house looked like, what the trees framing his home looked like. Um, so that became extremely urgent and I think really lit a fire under me around the work that I was already kind of doing on my own time. Um, and now that looks like, you know, using those materials and those things and working with them to create new materials, even as things change so that my family's property can continue to kind of be a beacon of culture in our community, even as it changes because the history there, um, you know, even pre-house, before our house was on that property, before the garden was on that property, um, there was a juke joint that my great-grandfather ran on their property <laughs> when they first bought the space. And, 
you know, my grandfather started, my grandparents started their business in the back, which incubated a lot of black businesses in our community. And so it's always been a source of like joy and food and culture and, you know, access to these things. And I feel like the work that I'm doing has connected me uh, to that so much deeper. And it feels good to be able to share that with other people. And so why is film your chosen medium to tell those stories? Mm. Um, so I, film in particular, to me, it just highlights uh, the mannerisms and the, you know, like I want my children to be able to see my grandfather's face and hear his voice and to see my great uncle's hands while he's out, you know, picking collards or growing something. Um, and so I couldn't, you can't really capture that with a lot of other mediums um, in the same way that you can with film. So it feels good to like know that um, as I'm like preserving these recipes and these um, agricultural traditions and these seeds, um, you know, whoever comes after me will have access to that in a very vivid and visceral way. And that feels pretty important to me right now. And last question, but you'll be back for a Q and A at the end with our other presenters. You mentioned vibrational cooking, and uh, that's how you cook in the video. Can you tell a little bit more about that for people who might not know? Mm, yes. So, uh, vibration cooking is a concept that from uh, Mother Verda May Grovner. She is um, a griot, uh, a Geechee griot woman who. Um, just really, for me, has been an example of how to take pride in your culture as a, as a Black person from the South. Um, and she acknowledges, you know, vibrational cooking from a standpoint of, you know, it takes skill and it takes memory and it takes connecting to kind of this ancestral uh, knowledge uh, versus what I think vibration cooking on the other hand has kind of been presented from like a make do or um, a scarcity point of view. Like we didn't have, so we just, you know, well, we had to use this, but there's a, I think in reclaiming that technology and reclaiming that way of being, um, I really want to celebrate it as um, also uh, a skill, you know, to be able to work around your kitchen and use these things and know these things well enough to create something beautiful um, on the fly or to trust yourself and be able to listen to yourself and listen to what you're making through smell and touch and taste uh, so that you can make something beautiful even without a recipe or guidance from, um, you know, a, a book or a show. You know, this mm -hmm. stuff lives inside of us. I love that, this idea of trusting yourself and without needing tablespoons or scales to do that. So, right. Thank you. And we'll see you at the end of the session again. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Thank you, Anne. Our next presenter, Melissa M. Martin, grew up on Bayou Chauvin on the Louisiana coast south of New Orleans. She has lived in New Orleans for 20 years, where she opened Mosquito Supper Club in 2014, where she ser serves family-style meals to small groups of guests. She's the author of the newly released Mosquito Supper Club, Cajun Recipes from a Disappearing Bayou, which is a stunning love letter to a way of life shaped by an environment that will not be there in a few decades. The book has been named a Best New Cookbook by Food & Wine and NPR's A Splendid Table, among others. So let's give a warm virtual welcome to Melissa Martin. Hello, everyone. Well, I just, Hello. Want, to say, I just want to say that that was an incredible presentation <laughs> um, that I saw before. So um, uh, I'm here in my home in um, New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I have a restaurant here called Mosquito Supper Club. And I grew up on uh, Bayou Petit Caillou in Chauvin, Louisiana, a tiny Cajun uh, fishing village. And to sort of understand where that is, if you can picture where New Orleans is and sort of you leave in your car from New Orleans and you drive uh, southwest um, for about half an hour and then you start going due south and you start heading straight to the Gulf of Mexico. 
um, what you start noticing in your hour and 15 minute um, drive is that the water just starts to surround you. And as you um, near closer and closer to Chauvin, um, water is just um, everywhere. So you're um, driving alongside a bayou on your um, left and to your right in the distance, you can see water and to your left on the other side, the bayou and small houses, you can also see water until you actually get to the end of the road. And then you're in at the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we still call it Lake Berry, but um, the reality is that it is the Gulf of Mexico and it has sort of um, come in to consume a lot of what is left of Louisiana's um, bayous and marshes um, from the area and the tiny fishing community that I grew up in. So we've lost land the size of the state of Delaware. And so whenever I um, wrote this cookbook, it was, um, and started the restaurant, it was to educate people about what was happening in South Louisiana, um, the myths of what it meant to be Cajun, sort of the truth of what we actually um, ate. And the way I went about doing that is to um, spend many, many months. Um, obviously, I grew up there and I spent most of my life there, but I left when I was 18 and moved to New Orleans. And so I went down and spent um, probably about three months in my parents' house living there. They still live in the same house I grew up in. They've been married for um, over 52 years. And I really tried to pay attention to the rhythms of the bayou and um, how they ate and um, what really makes this um, place and sets it apart from other places, the traditions, the cultures, the food. And what I realized in my time there is that everything revolves around food there and the catching of food and the preparing of food and the growing of food and um, the way that people so feed each other on the bayou is still quite special and something that we definitely should not let go of as a society and a community. I think it's the most important thing um, that happens around the world is how we feed each other and um, what happens at a table. And when I started Supper Club, um, I wanted people to share food experiences at a table. And that's what we did for many years. And now we are a little bit um, different as um, with our COVID regulations, but we're still trying to get people to talk and understand food and ingredients and where these ingredients come from. How did they end up on the bayou? Uh, what is gumbo? Um, all those questions we're trying to still answer and educate people and give, um, um, I guess, um, I guess, and make people understand that the um, the ingredients are from everywhere, and we need to um, acknowledge that, and we need to understand how you how you get to the food that you're eating, um, who is responsible for bringing it over, um, and so uh, that's a little bit about um, me and the book and uh, Mosquito Supper Club, and I chose to do. Uh, blackberry dumplings as um, the recipe today because it's something that I never saw anywhere else except for um, on the bayou. Um, I never saw it in restaurants. I never saw it in people's homes. Only growing up that I see that I see it. We had this um, fair called Lanyap on the bayou growing up. Lanyap means a little something extra. And um, it was sort of a community fair um, on bayou you from it stopped in the 90s it was probably the 60s through the 90s where everyone in the community came out and had sort of a different booth of food that they were celebrating so it was like farm to table before that was hip and um, everything from a turtle sauce pecan stand to a shrimp boulette stand to shrimp spaghetti and gumbos and ice cream and homemade bread and Bayes, you name the Cajun food on the bayou, it was represented. And, um, you know, people, locals bringing in turtles and uh, bringing in shrimp. Um, and it was the first time I really saw um, food in production. Um, I would just watch these women who, you know, normally went about their lives on a, on a daily basis. But for this um, one week in October, they would come together and produce just this mammoth amount of bread or these mammoth amounts of turtle soup and 
um, it was um, definitely a turning point for me to see, wow, this is what production looks like. And I'm a child at this time. And now, um, you know, being a chef in the industry, I still remember those moments where I watched um, these women put out so much food over this weekend. That was absolutely um, incredible. And so my parents had an ice cream stand. We made pop rouge ice cream, which is um, pop rouge just means like red soda. And um, pop rouge um, isn't circulated anymore, but it was a flavor that was around um, back in the day when uh, the fair started. And um, we were next door to the Black Dublin stand. And so we would take our bowls of ice cream and we would bring them over to the blackberry dumpling stand and get a blackberry dumpling put on it. And so that dessert that I serve at the restaurant sometimes, and that is directly from that um, moment in my life when I'm a child and I'm watching these people with these huge cauldrons of blackberries simmering and making these dumplings for thousands of people that come from all over the world to have um, Cajun food and to taste Cajun food. And, um, and the blackberries were actually foraged by everyone in the community. Everybody would go out and pick blackberries and they would freeze them and save them um, for the time when we would make it for um, guests from around the world. I guess in the same way that in a restaurant, we sort of get the best and we kind of save it for people who are coming into our um, restaurants and we celebrate all these um, ingredients and this um, cuisine with people. Um, so yes, we do the same. Um, me and uh, my staff will go down the bayou when it's blackberry season around April and we will pick all these wild berries that we can and freeze them so that we can use them till we run out. I mean, we are, we don't have any more space in our freezers um, so that we can share this um, tradition and this recipe with people in the restaurants. So yeah, we can uh, start the recipe right now if you wanna go to the next slide. So um, we take the berries and we um, add raw sugar. I am, um, in South Louisiana, we have access to raw sugar. So I get um, five gallons of raw sugar at a time. And it's the only sugar I use in the um, restaurant. And so we just take our berries and we um, macerate them with the raw sugar. Um, and you can go to the next slide. And um, yep, and you can go to the next one. And then you would leave it. Um, you, you would leave it like overnight um, or a couple of hours before you get it in a pot. And then we make our dumpling dough. Um, so in this slide, it, we are just combining our, um, whoa, stop. <laughs> we are just combining our uh, flour, our baking powder, our salt, and our uh, leaf lard. Um, I really appreciate this recipe because of how versatile these uh, simple ingredients um, are. I think that like Michael Ruhlman uh, wrote about just sort of the ratios of these simple ingredients and understanding the ratios of these um, and how you just, if you can understand the ratios of these simple ingredients, you can make almost um, anything. Obviously it's like, you know, the same thing for a, for a pancake or just slightly different for a biscuit. Um, but this is just like really, really simple ingredients and we make, um, you know, we uh, just sift together the baking powder, the flour, the AP, the salt, and then we cut in the lard in the same way you would cut in um, bis uh, biscuits, uh, butter for biscuits. And then um, whenever I pull together the batter, I do it in the same way that I would do uh, pasta. So making a well in the center, adding the eggs, and then um, adding the milk, you can go to the next slide. Yep. And um, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, and then I just bring it together with a fork. It's my uh, favorite utensils to use for this. Um, and then you don't wanna over mix. You just want to bring it um, together and that's how it should look. It can be a little bit lumpy. Um, and then instead of, uh, and then I always sprinkle a little bit of flour on top of it and um, you can go to the next slide and that keeps it from getting dry on top. And then it also helps whenever you're going to uh, 
spoon the um, dumplings out. Um, here we are, we are spooning the dumplings into our mix. So at this point we've taken our um, macerated berries and we put it into a heavy bottom pot and we have, if you just pause there for a second, and we have um, stewed them uh, for about 45 minutes. Um, we added a little bit of water. You're always gonna have to add water. I think in the recipe it calls for two cups, but it depends on how much liquid your blackberries um, um, how much comes out when you're macerating them. What you want is you want that um, dough to be floating. You don't want that, you drop that dough in, you don't want it to hit the bottom. So you need enough liquid where it's floating. And you also need enough liquid so that you can ladle on top of the, um, the dumplings. So whenever you start putting those dumplings in, you want the um, liquid to really be boiling. Um, there's sort of an like a in between where it's like you don't want it to go too far because you start losing all your liquid, but you want it to be hot and ready to go. So, um, so when you're doing that summer before like 45 minutes, kind of just on low, just getting it gone, then you want to crank it up and get ready for your dumplings. So, um, anyway, so we've dropped all our dumpling dough into that. You can go to the next slide, and um. Once you get them in there, you're going to let them sit for about um, almost five minutes until you can flip them. If you try to flip them and they start falling apart, then you need to stop. They haven't set on the bottom yet. Maybe you need to turn your fire up a little bit, but you're going to gently flip them over, all of them, and then you're going to cook the, um, second, um, the other side. The other side is not going to take as much time as... Um, the side and even though we've done this so so many times in the restaurant we always add an extra one so we can taste it and we can um make sure that they're um cooked in it and so here is your uh, final um dumpling really really fluffy beautiful ingredients um and then you can add your favorite scoop of ice cream on top of it um and yeah this is a very special uh, recipe for me um, that reminds me of my childhood on the bayou that we still make. We still like pull our blackberries out the freezer and make every time I go down the bayou. It looks really delicious, Melissa. And we'll, um, uh, we'll go to more questions in the Q&A part at the end, but a quick one from the audience. Uh, Karen is asking, can you sub butter for vegetarians or do you need the lard for texture and fluffiness? You can sub butter. I, I don't think it's gonna be as fluffy um, but you can sub butter. I can say that uh, growing up, this recipe was made with uh, um, biscuit mix. Um, the ladies used Pioneer biscuit mix, which has a lot of the um, hydrogenated oils in it. And so I think if you go to butter, it's just gonna be a little bit flatter um, than, the, than what, I, what I'm trying to achieve. And that's why I use the lard instead of Crisco and I, obviously instead of the Pioneer baking mix uh -huh. um, because you really want that fluffy thing. And my mom actually made the ones in the last picture. Um, she kind of food sell the book. Oh, great. <laughs> she well, made a lot of the food. <laughs> thank you so much, Melissa. And we'll see you in a few minutes. Absolutely. Our final presenter for this session, Sofia Muzoki, is joining us from Jamaica, where she's currently studying, but she's originally from Uganda. A food blogger, writer, and photographer, Sophia's work through A Kitchen in Uganda, which is also her Instagram handle, has been instrumental in bringing Ugandan cuisine to the world. Her blog has been nominated for a prestigious Saber Magazine Award in the food culture category, and she has been featured on Cuisine Noir and CNN, among many others. And she has self-published three eBooks, one of which won the Gourmet World Cookbook Award. You'll be able to get those during her Meet the Author session at the break. So let's start by watching a video that Sofia made to demo Kabala Gala or Ugandan pancakes. I am Sofia Masoki, a food writer, photographer, and blogger at A Kitchen in Uganda. We are making Kabala Gala, which is the Ugandan pancake. This pancake needs two major ingredients, which are sweet bananas and cassava flour. Traditionally, sweet apple bananas are used, but I will be using these regular bananas. 
you still get a similar taste. When it comes to sweets in Ugandan cuisine, we do not have that many and most of the ones consumed are introduced from the West, such as cakes, pies, cookies and so many more. Traditionally, fresh fruit is eaten because the land is abundant in high sugar content fruit. We will be mashing the bananas until almost smooth. I am adding sugar and baking soda here to sweeten and soften the pancakes, although these two ingredients are usually not used. I am also using my hands to mix and knead the dough so that I can know when it is time to add more or to stop adding flour altogether. After the dough is ready, we flatten it using our fingers to about a centimeter in thickness. Next, we will cut out round shaped pancakes using glass or you can use a cookie cutter if you have one until all the dough is used up. We will then fry our pancakes in medium hot oil because cassava tends to burn really quickly. We want to make sure that the pancakes stay golden and are fully cooked through. After frying, the pancakes are ready to be served. They are usually served for breakfast or as snacks. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Anne, for that beautiful introduction. I hope the video you have just watched has given you a glimpse into Ugandan food. Um, so when it comes to Ugandan food, there's a lot of questions, and I want to share one more example of what we call Ugandan food. Um, please, can I have the slide ready for Rolex? Right, thank you. Could you please go to the next slide? Oh, all right, great. So um, I know when you think of the word Rolex, what comes to your mind is a timepiece. In Uganda, it is not a timepiece. Instead, it is a popular street snack that consists of a chapati, a fried egg, and some vegetables, which are rolled into a delicious roll. And this Rolex has gained popular media coverage from houses like CNN and has been popularized by tourists. It was introduced by young, young Ugandans who were interested in creating creative food, especially in the center of Kampala. Next slide. When it comes to Ugandan food, uh, the biggest question we are asked is, what is Ugandan food? And this is a very hard question to answer because unlike countries like Ethiopia, Uganda does not have a distinct flavor or taste. And this is because of our unique geographical location. So as you can see to the north, we are bordered by South Sudan. To the west, we are bordered by Congo. To the southwest, Rwanda, Tanzania to the south, and Kenya to the east. And we have 54 unique languages and tribes. And we use English as a way of communicating with each, with each other. And these unique cultural blends will feature in the food that we eat. Next slide. Um, aside from internal cultural influences, we have also external influences, such as the British colonial influence, which will explain our love for tea. Ugandans love to take tea a lot. 
So we grow a lot of tea, we export it and we take it. And then we have the East African Arab trade influence, which explains our love for fried dough, which we call mandazi, and pilau, which is party food, pilau rice. And then we have the Indian influence, where we get our love for chapati, just like you have seen in the Rolex, and our love for samosas, which we call sumbusa in the country, and also our love for curry spice, which is the only spice that we use in almost everything. And then lastly, we have the modern Western influence, which has been brought about by globalization and the media. So you will find that in the country, we have popular fast food joints like um, fried chicken, um, pizza, you can find all of that there. Next slide. I can divide Ugandan diet into two major diets where we have the pre-colonial diet and the post-colonial diet. The pre-colonial one is heavily traditional and is influenced by cultural blends, the type of climate each tribe or region is located, the kind of plants and animals that, that region and the climate allow to grow and the need to grow the need to preserve food for future consumption. This is our traditional food, and it is usually reserved for special occasions because we still want to hold on to that and preserve our history. So you will notice that most of this food is reserved for royalty or special occasions such as weddings. I will talk more about it later on. And then we have a post-colonial diet, which is everything, including all the influences I have mentioned, to this day. So you can find that a typical Ugandan on a regular day will eat, will have a Rolex for breakfast, which of course, as we have seen, has Indian influences. And in the afternoon, maybe they'll have a traditional dish. And in the evening, they'll probably order something like fried chicken. So we have all these blends within the country. Next slide. When it comes to flavor, Ugandan food is mildly flavored and it is almost not spice. In fact, we don't use hot spices to our food. And this is because we rely heavily on fresh ingredients. And again, this is because of how we are uniquely geographically situated in that the equator runs through the country. So this means we have an abundance of rainfall and it makes it easier for us to have fresh food all year round. Aside from fresh food, we have drying. We dry a lot of our grains and pulses and then we have roasting where we roast um, our meat we actually have a popular um, tourist area where you can taste roasted poultry and meat if you ever visit uganda and then we have smoking the picture on my right is a photo of a tender smoked bamboo which we use to make stew i will talk more about it later on then we have fermenting salting and then mixing elements such as soda ash and rock salt into food to preserve it. Next slide. Um, so to give you an example of all those flavors I have talked about, we have matoke, which are green mashed bananas. And I would compare these in texture to mashed potatoes, although they are not flavored. And this is because they are a good vehicle for hearty stews. And then we have wombo, which is banana leaf steamed stew. And the process of steaming the stew, you can use meat, um, fish, poultry, but the element that makes this stew really special is steaming the stew in a banana tempered, in a tempered banana leaf. And so what you get is a stew that is infused with some banana flavors. If I know you understand this, if you have used banana leaves to cook food, and it also has some smokiness in it. This is a very special dish and is served to royalty. And then we have malewa which is smoked bamboo shoots, which I just showed you earlier. When it is time to cook it, it is tenderized with um, soda ash and then cooked into a rich stew of groundnut or simsim paste. Simsim would be sesame, and this is because it is grown in the northern part of the country. Next slide. And then we have a shower, which is whipped ghee sauce. And this is whipping ghee or butter with water which is dissolved with rock salt. And what you get is something similar in text and look to yogurt that is salted with a buttery aftertaste. This is also a special dish 
that is served on weddings. And then we have akalo, which is also called akaro or obundu. And this is a millet sorghum meal. We have a lot of millet and sorghum in our diet. And this meal is made by grinding these grains and mixing them with cassava flour and then gradually mingling them to form a pudding-like meal. And this is eaten with stews. It's almost similar to fufu if you are familiar with Nigerian food. And then lastly, we have sombe, which are cassava leaves, tender cassava leaves that are ground and then stewed into a rich, delicious stew, which is then flavored with red palm oil. Sometimes smoked fish is used on it. And not only do we eat the leaves, but we also eat the tubers. And then we use the stems to either plant more cassava or as firewood. So nothing goes to waste. Next slide. And to give you a visual idea of what I am talking about, on my left we have mukene, which is silver fish in English. And this is abundantly harvested from the Lake Victoria. And we use this, we eat this either as a snack or as a stew. And it's, it is highly nutritious that it is put in baby food to boost their immunity. In the middle, we have what we call posho. And this is similar to polenta in texture, but it is a bit firmer. And we eat this with almost any stews we have available. And we mostly use white maize as compared to yellow maize. And then lastly, we have another variety of bananas, which is different from the banana you saw in the pancake video. It is also different from plantain, and it is different from the green bananas, which I used to make matoke. These are specifically grown to make juice, which we call omubisi in Uganda, and this would translate to honey. And this is because it is very, very it has a high sugar content that when it's time to consume it, it is usually diluted. Um, the grass in the foreground is used to extract this juice and we usually use it to make gin or liquor. And when it's produced on a larger scale, we use feet to extract the juice, just like grapes. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot to talk about. I know my time is out, is over, and there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of flavors to explore in Uganda. And I, I want you, I want to implore you to explore Uganda whenever you have a chance to experience this for yourself. Sophia, thank you so much. The, the amount you covered in such a short period is incredible. Um, and we'll have questions now, but you'll also be in a meet the author session for people who want to uh, learn more from you uh, during that time. So I'm going to now invite Melissa and Gabriel back on the screen. And while they come up, I'll ask you a couple of questions that came up from the audience while you were presenting. Um, what, uh, Amy asks, what are the traditional oils used for cooking and now currently used oils if they have changed? All right, so usually traditionally we used palm oil and peanut oil. And this is because this is oil that we can process ourselves. So you'll find that palm oil, red palm oil is, is different from, you know, the commercialized palm oil. It's what most people use traditionally to cook and peanut oil. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Melissa and Gabriel, but obviously Ugandan cuisine being so little known in the U.S., there are a couple more questions for Sophia that I'll ask now. <laughs> hey, that's, that's uh, right? <laughs> uh, could you share some Ugandan fermented dishes or foods? All right. So we have um, a dish which uses fermented cassava. It is similar to akalo, which I just mentioned earlier, and this i would compare this to the nigerian fufu we use fermented cassava and this is to remove again the toxin cyanide and then what when it's after it's fermented it is dried and pounded into flour and then this is used to make a meal which is then used to accompany most stews and then what kind of meat am i asking is typical for luwombe stew all right so Traditionally, typically, they use chicken, and um, this is because it was served to royalty, and it is known that women don't eat chicken, so chicken is reserved for men, and royalty was usually men. So um, chicken is mostly used, but you can use any meat. You can use beef, you can use goat meat, lamb, 
You can even use fish if you have that and vegetables if you have them. Great. And I invite the three of you to ask questions of each other if you want. I'm happy to stay completely out of the way. <laughs> No, this is very exciting. I'm like, oh yes, goat, you say? <laughs> Tell us more. Uh, Melissa, you're, uh, we don't have you on video, but hopefully you can hear us. Um, so, uh, Melissa, uh, Emma is asking, can any other berries be used to the same effect for the dumplings? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, blackberries is what we had down the bayou, but I'm sure that you could use uh, raspberries would break down in the same way. Salmon berries, if you're in the Pacific Northwest, would break down the same way. Um, and I think that it, those are good because they're going to coat, you know, mulberries. Um, they're going to coat the dough in the same way. Possibly <laughs> strawberries if you um, pounded them or, um, or put them in a food processor. Okay, so the important, the breaking down part is the important part. Yeah. Um, and Gabriel and Melissa, when we were um, chatting before the session started, we're talking about the South that's often perceived as this monolith from the outside, but from North Carolina to Southern Louisiana, there are a lot of differences. Can you talk about that a little bit? And what is your South? Mm. Well, I just want to say, um, oh my God, those blackberry dumplings look so good. <laughs> um, and I heard you say, like, I think I heard you reference it. You know, you haven't really seen it outside of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's so cool to me, I think, though the South is definitely not a monolith, is like finding um, some of these recipes that may be done differently. Um, but have the same base ingredients. And mm -hmm. one of my favorite um, women, black women, farmers and, and chefs is Dory Sanders and her book, Country Cooking. She talks about skillet blackberry dumplings. And mm -hmm. I, there's so many, you know, like I feel like traditional food ways through the South, like those elements of foraging and what was seasonal and then um, kind of using what you had on hand to create something like a dumpling or like that. Um, yeah, it's I like a collar or a dumpling. Yeah, exactly. Or it's like all of those things combined. And um, I think that in um, my book, what I what I tried to do so much of is to remind people like where like where do these things come from? And so um, you know, not talking about dumplings in general, but you know, I I cook with a guy from um, from Senegal. He has a pop up in New Orleans called De Carnola. Oh yeah, he's um, absolutely incredible, and he's cooked yeah. all over the world. And we do pop ups together, so we can just take these ingredients that are from Africa that came to the um, to South Louisiana, and then we can see if his mom would do the one pot cooking, and then how I did the one pot cooking. And I think that you know, um, whenever I started really delving into these ingredients after I um, left home, you started to um, sort of learn history that wasn't taught to us growing up. And I think that um, you know, I mean, the big one that everybody needs to keep remembering is that okra and gumbo are the same word. You know, so for me, if you don't have okra, you don't have gumbo, you know. Um, but we have a gumbo question, actually, Melissa, from Nick. Uh, he's asking, is fillet powder still used for traditional gumbo? I have sassafras trees that grow in my yard, but I have read that the leaves are carcinogenic. I mean, that's not really true. But um, the, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, fillet is from native, uh, the native population. And so if I go down the bayou right now, I some elders have, and I can get fresh filet powder, and then I would use that at the end of a gumbo to um, season it. Um, and we definitely always have little bottles of filet powder. They're in like a uh, used baby um, glass baby containers in your freezer, and you get fresh filet um, every year. And uh, Sophia, we have a question from Cyril for you. I'd love to cook Uganda in dishes. What ingredients could be hard to source and what's your favorite substitute? Um, Ugandan food. So Ugandan food is actually, there's a lot of Ugandans in the US and most of the ingredients that you can find are usually found in either Asian stores 
all West African stores. Because of our similarities in cuisine, chances are that you will find some of the ingredients there. They also use a lot of green bananas, and Indians as well use green bananas. So if you go to Indian stores, chances are you'll find some of the ingredients there. What was the second question? Uh, uh, where, what's your favorite substitute? Oh, um, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> well, so, you were telling um, us in Jamaica, you don't really need to substitute because you yes, find all yes, that. That's true. That's true. Um, I guess it would. I would go back to the video that you saw earlier. Um, since I didn't have the small bananas, which are traditionally used to make the pancake, I substituted with the large, regular ones, and it still works really great. Um, Gabriel, you use magnolia leaves, um, and I was wondering because I had never heard of that before seeing it in a demo you had done earlier this summer, and so fascinating. And that made me wonder because in Louisiana there are also so many magnolia trees, and do you use them, Melissa, or is this widely spread? Is this something you do in particular, Gabriel? That's a question I have. A magnolia. Tree. Yeah, I have a magnolia tree at the restaurant. We put, and there's a table one that we call it the magnolia table. But no, I've never used magnolia leaves. Is it just from a regular magnolia tree? Yeah. Or is it a specific yeah. magnolia tree? No, it's that southern grandiosa magnolia that everybody's mm -hmm. grandma has mm -hmm. in their backyard. And I, I think that's really like once I learned about that as a seasoning technique. Um, and like some of its medicinal values, it really kind of drew me to like what other uses, um, what other ways I can use magnolia and the bark also and the flowers. I mean, it's it's just mm -hmm. a, it's a beautiful ingredient and it's delicious um, for teas and different things. Um, it's like okra. You can use every part of the okra plant. Oh my God, yes, exactly. Um, and so one question for all three of you really, um, what's the most urgent thing to do to make sure that your heritage is preserved for generations to come? Um, and how can people who are watching can uh, help ensure that the foodways from rural North Carolina, the Louisiana Bayou and Uganda don't disappear? Mm. All right, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> so I, when Gabrielle was talking about um, vibration cooking, that resonated so well with me because this is something that we do. And measurements are almost unheard of. And I had to reconcile being a, a person who wants to write about Ugandan food to people who don't know it and to people who already know it because measurements are, it's almost non-existent because people just, it's, it's years and years of experience and people already know how much salt, how much of this ingredient and that to put in. So I think the task for me is to be able to, to reconcile these two differences and still be able to preserve the tradition and also present this unique um, way of cooking and eating to the world. I wonder. Yeah, I mean, that resonates the same way with me that um, none of these recipes were written down. And so I took on this task of being this medium for this women on the bayous and for um, the food that they made on a daily basis, something that we would eat on Monday through Friday. And, uh, and the way I did it was actually standing next to my mother and watching her do every single thing and then putting that down on paper and then testing it until it I till the flavor you know came back to me and that and it, and it is hard because um, it, it's very hard as a restaurant owner to teach that you can't necessarily teach intuition and you you can't teach what you've um, been learning your whole life but we can try to document it and I think that we can try to dispel myths and really bring people back to the um, earth and the stories and to what where it all comes from i think that the more people get exposed to history and how things come about then they can understand people around their communities around the world and um and we can sort of rewrite history and truth and and food and community yeah 
I, I think what Melissa said about the things not being written down, uh, that's very true for, at least for what I've experienced. Um, it's really supporting those people who grow the food. Um, I think my that's shown up with Black farmers for me. Uh, they hold a lot of the oral history about the ways to both like connect to the soil, grow the food, keep the seeds, um, and then cook the food and preserve the food. And I think like finding ways to um, document those things, but also like just connecting with them and finding ways to support them is another way that I think we can keep those stories alive and those techniques alive. Um, and so that's been my direct experience with like trying to preserve those things. We have a few more questions that have come in the two minutes we have left. Yeah. So um, Gabriel, there are two for you. I'll put them together. Are mag magnolia flowers edible? And can you uh, give the name of the, and the author of the book on Southern cooking that you cited? <laughs> yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> Dory Sanders. Um, this book is called uh, Dory Sanders Country Cooking. Um, She's, uh, she's still living, she's in Georgia, she's a farmer, her family grows peaches, um, among other things, and she's got an incredible legacy um, doing this work. I call myself a cultural preservationist. There's so many women before me that have been doing this work to tell our stories, um, especially through cooking, and she's one of those foremothers, um, in my opinion. And so if you get a chance to check her out or go to her farm stand in Georgia, you should. And magnolia flowers are edible. And magnolia flowers are edible, yes. <laughs> and then this last one, we have one minute, and that's a big one. So uh, your elevator pitch answer to this. Are there common ingredients that uniquely span the cuisines of North Carolina, Louisiana, uh, Ghana, Al Ad Uganda, and Jamaica? Fish. Okay. <laughs> Fish, okra, Sophia, what would be your answer? Um, root tubers. We eat a lot of those. Mm -hmm. Great. Sweet and potatoes. Say that again. Sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. like. I imagine some of the preserving techniques, like how we keep things, are really similar. Um, I know how we cure pork and make um, different things. Uh, using salt to dry and cure so some of those yes. salt pork is huge you know in almost every recipe and i can't get it anymore so we just have to do it ourselves we just have to salt our own pork so and that is sort of in all old cultures of a way of preserving and, and a lot of greens also it seems right from what all of you have shown there's there's a little bit of greens and everything uh -huh. yes all right thank you so very much and the audience will get to spend more time with each of you which is really wonderful melissa and sophia in you meet the authors and gabrielle on the panel after the break so thank you so so much for spending this morning with us yeah thank you for having us before we go to the break um let's watch a short video courtesy of woodstone our premium gold sponsor I was getting lost in the music, but I was also thinking and looking at your comments in the in the chat, and it's so wonderful to see. And uh, it was really, really special to have 
um, these three amazing presenters bringing food, stories, heritage, and, and all with such a gift for storytelling that is really, re really unique and special. And uh, we never take that for granted. And it's been such a treat to uh, get to be in immersed in their worlds in such ways this morning. Um, after the break, we'll go into our first round of breakout sessions. You can see them listed on the slide right here. Um, and you do not need to fear missing out on any of the, the breakouts because there will be recordings of each posted along with recipes and presentation. So when you pick one, you don't miss out on the others. You'll get to watch them later. During the break itself, you'll get more chances to win really cool prizes by, net by networking and engaging in the various activities. And one of the prizes is, of course, registration and travel to next year's Worlds of Flavor in Napa if you participate at every opportunity. Oops. As mentioned earlier, our Meet the Author sessions will feature Melissa Martin and Sofia Muzoki. So join them there for more questions. And there and throughout, share your audio and video to join up on screen. And if you don't want to, you can, of course, always chat in the chat box. But don't be shy about popping up on screen. We also have a special pop-up presentation on Shabu Shabu during the break with chefs from Sushi Taro in Washington, D.C. And click on networking for a four-minute conversation with a randomly selected partner. Today's conversation starter is, what new global dishes did you explore and start cooking at home during the pandemic? And here is a map of all the great offering in the Sponsor Expo. So hurry up and get to the break since you have lots of great offerings to check out. After that, log into the breakout sessions at 2.30 p.m. 11.30 Pacific, 2.30 Eastern, 11.30 Pacific, and you will find those um, on the left side of your screen under sessions. So um, enjoy the break. See all of the great things on this um, schedule that you can uh, check out, all of the different demos that our presenter, that our sponsors are offering, um, all of the meet the authors. And then um, remember, each time you hit an activity, that's one more chance to win a prize, cookbooks, baskets, all these kind of great things. So um, wonderful. We'll see you back uh, in the breakouts at 2.30 or 11.30 or other 30s, depending on where you're joining us from. And uh, enjoy. Thank you.